All right, so, so we're here for the uh, final Pioneers uh, Seminar Series of the Year. Uh, I've been requested to announce that uh, Dr. Jamie Smith actually just got official notice of his uh, R01. So I guess we'll start with that. <laughs> Uh, and, and now we'll move on to our speaker today, uh, Dr. Marion Pepper from the University of Washington. Uh, so it's my absolute privilege today to introduce our seminar speaker. Um, Marion received her PhD from the UPenn School of Medicine in the laboratory of Chris Hunter. Uh, following that, she did a postdoc in Mark Jenkins' lab at the University of Minnesota where she studied memory T-cell and TFH differentiation um, and published some papers that still, I think, inspire our lab's work uh, today. Uh, from there, she uh, moved to the Department of Immunology at the University of Washington. Uh, where she will be promoted to associate professor in early July. So uh, congratulations. Great. Can't believe that much time has gone by so quickly. Um, so you can tell she's moved from Philadelphia to Minneapolis to Seattle. And so we were joking last night about how Marion's kind of moved uh, across the country westward. And so while her career has moved geographically westward, uh, I think her career trajectory has actually moved more skyward. Um, she's publishing the I know. She published in top <laughs> journals, uh, Immunity Cell Reports, uh, Nature Communications, Science, uh, fantastic journals, really great papers. Um, her research program is currently supported by the NIH, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and most recently, Burroughs Welcome Foundation. Um, so she's a world-class immunologist who's made numerous contributions to our understanding of adaptive immunity. Uh, and we're excited to hear her talk today, understanding the differentiation and function of tissue-resident uh, CD4 positive memory T cells. So please join me in welcoming uh, Marion Pepper. Thank you, Ken. It's really nice to be here. Um, it's nice to see you doing so well. That's great. Uh, make sure I turn this on. And so I was joking earlier when, when I was asked where this picture was from because the two people who actually know Seattle said, we never saw whales there. And it's true, you don't really ever see whales right in front of the city. But um, I generally joke about the weather and the fact that it's always sunny and we always see whales. And none of that's actually true. But the reason why I actually bring up these whales and why these whales are on this, uh, on this slide is because I think they actually draw a really good analogy for the work that we're doing. And um, just bear with me for those of you who are like, whoa, we're going down a weird track here. Um, so if you go to Seattle, hopefully you'll be able to see some whales on a whale watching trip or even off some of the islands. And what you learn about these whales is even though they all look the same, if you actually study them and get to know them, they're different. And there are actually two different types of whales that are found um, in the waters outside of Seattle. One population that's resident that lives in this dark yellow area up in the Salish Sea, and another that's transient that goes all the way up and down North America. And the reason why I bring this up is because if you start to study these whales and um, pay attention to, to their, what I call phenotypes, um, you actually learn that they have different shaped fins, they have different markings on their back, and they actually are now being considered two separate species because they haven't interbred for over a thousand years. Importantly, they also have functional differences. So these resident whales, they only eat fish, they're pescatarians, there are only about 78 of them left, which is sort of sad, but. These transients eat sea mammals, and that may not matter to you or me, but it matters a lot if you're that little guy right there. And so the point of my, my analogy here is that immunologists are often criticized for looking at these minutia, small differences in cell subsets, what they look like, what they do, where they go. But if you don't know what uh, something is capable of killing and what it can go after, you can't generate a good vaccine to actually target that, that pathogen. And so my lab has spent a long time thinking about these, <coughs> these questions and focusing on the migratory and phenotypic and functional characteristics of CD4 memory B cells. <laughs> That's what I say now, because we work on CD4 T cells and memory B cells, so I just clump them all together into one big cell. But no, today I'm going to talk about CD4 memory uh, T cells. And as many of you know, there are actually a lot of different types of CD4 T cells, and it can get quite confusing. Um, but Ken hopefully has, has drilled these transcription factors into your head so you know a lot about um, how these cells uh, function and what they do. 
But basically, a naive CD4 T cell will get activated when it recognizes its cognate peptide on a peptide MHC complex on a dendritic cell. It will interpret all sorts of different cues from that dendritic cell, including co-stimulatory molecules and cytokines. And that will lead it down a process where it will both differentiate into a type of cell that can produce a specific kind of cytokine. Um, a Th1 cell, for example, expresses interferon gamma. Th2 cell expresses IL-4, IL-5, et cetera, et cetera. And these are regulated by these master transcription factors. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how these, these uh, signals are driven, what the dendritic cell is giving, what signals the dendritic cell is giving to these cells to drive these populations. And again, this is important because these different types of cells have different um, abilities to control pathogens. So Toxoplasma gondii, which is right here, um, you need interferon gamma to control that. And in an interferon gamma knockout animal, um, those mice die within five to seven days. So these, these uh, cytokines produced by these T cells are critical for a lot of pathogen regulation. Um, but unfortunately, they can also contribute to immunopathology, and especially Th2 cells. So Th2 cells are classically known to protect against worm infection, against big macroscopic infections. Um, but Th2 cells are also generated in response to allergens. And this is a house dust mite right here. That's sort of scary looking, actually. Um, and so what we're trying to understand is um, how can we suppress the generation of these Th2 cells in responses to allergens, and how can we make them better in response to pathogens um, like worms? Um, and specifically, we're studying this in the context of memory formation. Because after all of these effector cells get made and proliferate and expand logarithmically, about 90% of these cells die, and you're left with about 10% that are qualitatively better, so that if you actually see that pathogen again in a secondary uh, response, the response is much, much faster. So what is different about the cell at this time point than it was here? And um, that has been a major focus of what my lab has been working, working on for the last uh, several years. And as many of you know, um, for probably about 15, uh, the last 15 to 20 years, the major subsets of memory T cells that were described were the circulating memory T cells. So central memory cells, which are these plastic, proliferative um, cells that can migrate into the lymph nodes due to their expression of CCR7, <coughs> and effector memory cells that can actually migrate into the tissues and produce lots and lots of interferons and um, interferon gamma or uh, Th2 cytokines to actually protect against a pathogen. So they have faster effector function, but they're thought to maybe expand less. So it's sort of this division of labor. And um, what has more recently been shown is that the real major uh, population of memory cells that is far more uh, uh, prevalent than either one of these circulating memory cells are these tissue resident memory cells. And these are memory cells that leave the circulation and go into the tissues and can reside there for the life of an organism. Um, and these have really been studied well for uh, CD8 T cells. And um, you can see in this little, uh, this little drawing here that the, um, both the effector memory cells and the resident memory cells go into non-lymphoid tissues but the effector memory cells can then go back out, whereas the, the resident memory cells are thought to stay there. Um, they are thought to express CD69 even when that T cell isn't getting activated, so even when it's not seeing its antigen, it expresses this marker of recent activation. But a lot is not known about these cells. They, they're known to be good sentinels, they're known to protect against viruses, how they're generated, what they do um, is not really known. And yeah. Um, when, when a tissue resident memory cell takes up residence, uh, do other signals in the future, can other signals in the future change it, or is it absolutely set? It's a great so question. Um, we know that if we um, come back with a secondary challenge, they can rapidly produce um, effector cytokines, but whether they, so they get activated, they do make cytokines, but whether they actually change their phenotype or whether they die after that, 
or do they form new memory cells? We're, we're still in the process of trying to understand. Yep, not, not well known. Um, and what's interesting about these cells is they're different in different tissues, and that's also added to the complexity of studying these. Um, so, for example, in the lungs, which is what I'm going to talk about today, you can find both CD4 and CD8 tissue resident memory cells um, within the lung parenchyma. Um, while in the gut and skin, um, a lot of the work that's been done has shown that it's primarily CD8 T cells, at least in the skin and the epithelial layers, and in the gut and the epithelial layers, which you can see here in the, in the, um, in the intestines here. Um, but how, how these different populations are retained, what they do, and how they're regulated by the environment is still very much um, not, not known at this point. And even less is known for CD4 T cells than is known for CD8 T cells. Um, so we were really interested in um, learning about these cells in the process of allergic airway inflammation, or asthma. And so asthma, as many of you know, is a major cause of childhood illness in developed countries. There are more than 300 million people worldwide. Um, it's characterized by acute, intermittent, and uh, recurrent episodes of airway inflammation. So about 50% of um, asthmatic uh, cases are associated with allergen and allergic um, induction of the asthmatic response. And these allergen-specific CD4 cells are known to contribute to uh, asthma through the production of type 2 cytokines, so IL-4 and IL-5 and IL-13, um, as well as the induction of IgE expression by B cells. And so when we started, uh, when I started my lab, I started thinking about well, what would be a good system to study lung resident CD4 T cells. Well, it's known and has been known for a really long time that non-asthmatic recipients of asthmatic uh, lungs, so they, they have some other more pressing need for lungs, um, <coughs> they can develop asthma post-transplantation. So the disease is transferred with the lungs. Um, Inversely, asthmatic patients who re receive non-asthmatic lungs lose disease. They resolve their disease for at least three years, which is as long as this has been looked at. Um, so in our minds, this really pointed to the fact, and just the rapid um, reoccurrence of the, the symptoms, that there was potentially uh, tissue resident memory cells that were sitting in the lungs that could contribute to this disease. And we decided to use a model that's been used by many labs before of house dust mite sensitization. And um, house dust mites, bizarrely enough, I didn't know this when I started it, are actually the most common cause of allergic dri of allergen-driven asthma. Um, and what's really nice about this system is if you want to um, look at memory cells in response to a, 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 some sort of antigenic challenge, with the house dust mite, you just give the mice house dust mite intranasally. You don't add any adjuvant. You don't add anything to it. And they will develop airway inflammation, um, unlike other systems with ova and alum and things that stick around for a long time. So it's hard to really assess whether you're generating memory or not. And so what we did is took a trick out of the Jenkins lab um, work that I did. And we generated class two MHC tetramers. And what these are, it's just, uh, I, I, I sort of think of it as a fake antigen presenting cell with a big bright fluorescent probe on it. So these are peptide MHC molecules right here, these uh, purple and yellow um, structures here. Here's the <coughs> peptide. Um, and they are biotinylated. And when that biotinylated, what we call peptide monomer, is added to a streptavidin that expresses this brightly fluorescent molecule, phy phycoerythrin, you can actually identify CD4 T cells that have the right T cell receptor to bind this complex. And we can use these to actually identify the T cells that are responding to this um, cysteine protease called derpy one which is in the house dust mite extract. So it's a major protein um, associated with atopy in um, the house dust mite system. And so we made two tetramers against this epitope um, that we pulled out using algorithms from a region of the molecule that had already been shown to be immunogenic. And only one was actually driving the immune response. And so that's what the rest of this work is looking at, is the, the polyclonal T cell response to this nine amino acid um, epitope right here. 
And so while I was in Mark's lab, one of the things that we realized is it's really hard to study CD4 T cells because they're very, very infrequent, especially endogenous um, ones in a whole animal. And so what we came up with is this method where we stain the spleen and lymph nodes with our tetramers. We then come back with beads that have um, anti-PE antibodies on them. So it basically links this magnetic bead to our tetramer. And then we put this whole thing over a magnetized column. And what that does is it enriches for our cells of interest. So you lose about 199 million cells, which is basically the spleen and all the lymph nodes. Um, but within that column, you still retain uh, your cells of interest, which are about, uh, you know, range in a naive animal from 60 cells to after immunization about 10,000. So still really small numbers, but they're enriched within this larger population of total cells. So uh, this is the model that we use for this um, system. We give one dose of um, house dust mite intranasally that's relatively large, um, and then we give five smaller doses um, during this challenge phase. Um, and then we can look to see how these allergen-specific cells develop, where they go, what they look like, what they do. And we've had to develop really stringent gating strategies to find these small populations of cells. So what you can see here, uh, these cells that are, are on this axis, this is B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Um, this population, which gets stuck in the um, column, is largely made up of B cells because the B cells can also bind the phycoerythrin molecule. So it's really important to actually gate those cells out. But if we look at our CD4 cells, we can find this really small population of CD44 low uh, T cells, which is the marker of activation, that are binding to our tetramer. Now, if I hadn't done this a million times, I would look at that and say, <laughs> okay. But this is what happens when you immunize. So if you give one dose of intranasal house dust mite allergen, we see this massive expansion of these cells. So now there's about 3,800 of these cells. And they've upregulated CD44, showing that they've actually encountered their antigen. Um, and this is all uh, bead enriched to pull those cells out. And what was interesting, and we were a little surprised but hopeful um, by this result, is that if we then uh, did the full allergic sensitization, we actually saw fewer cells in the spleen and lymph nodes than what we had previously seen at that day six post uh, immunization time point. And so we decided, okay, this is our chance to look in the lungs and see if we actually are making cells that are, are, are migrating to the lungs. And we took a trick from uh, Dave Massapist and actually Tom Bracciali before that, um, where you inject an antibody against thi 1.2, which is expressed on all T cells. That antibody circulates throughout the mouse within about three minutes so that when you sacrifice the mouse, all the cells that are in the circulation that are in the blood are going to be labeled with that antibody, all the T cells. And what that lets us do effectively is look for cells that are circulating, which are now going to be positive for thi 1.2, which you can see here very nicely, um, versus those that are not uh, circulating, which are in the tissues. And uh, this, these two little dots here, occasionally in the lungs we can catch naive cells that are circulating through, but we don't see um, derpy one specific, so allergen specific cells in the tissue. Um, and most mice we don't even catch it. This was, a, this was a good day when we caught those two cells. But if you look at a day six animal post-primary uh, response, so one dose of allergen, what you see now is that there are more cells in the lung, and some of those cells have actually gone into the tissue. And if we do the full um, allergen dose, so all five hits of this lower dose of allergen, those cells continue to expand, and almost 95% of them are now in the tissue itself as they don't express thi 1.2. And I'll show you some histology showing you that, um, which was really nice because it showed us that we actually now had cells that we could find in the lung tissues. And so where were they? And it's a little bit hard to see here, um, but they largely are around the blood vessels and the airways. Um, you can see an airway here. Um, and they are in close proximity to uh, B cells, which again, I'll show you later. Um, but they, they form these, um, what are called eyeball structures, which are these tertiary lymphoid structures that we can now find in the lungs. And these T cells can be found here at all time points after. Every time point that we've looked, we 
we can actually find these T cells. So what are they? So are they really Th2 cells? Are they um, Th17 cells? What kind of cells are they? And so we used several different reporter mice to actually assess what kinds of, of cells these were. We used one that reports IL-4 expression and another that reports IL-13 expression. And as has been shown in um, several different publications looking at worm infection, there really are no IL-13 or IL-4 expressing T cells in the spleen and lymph nodes except for T follicular helper cells, which are the cells that activate B cells, which you can see right here. Um, they all express mRNA, really high levels of it, but the only protein expressors are the TFH cells, um, which raises a lot of questions about what's been called a Th2 cell in the spleen and lymph node, which I always thought was interesting. But if we look in the lung, we do find IL-4 expressors, never more than about 20% of them. Um, these uh, cells that do express IL-4 also express CD69, as do the cells that express uh, IL-13. And so we could see both uh, of these, these two cytokines. We looked for other cytokines. We see an early burst of IL-17 producers, but those go away quickly. And so we're still trying to figure out if those convert into something else, or do they die, or what are they doing? But we don't know. So these cells do express Th2 cytokines, and for the, the airway inflammation aficionados, we got a lot of questions about, well, is this asthma? Have you created an asthma model? Or is this even um, airway inflammation? And so, and is it CD4 T cell dependent? And so what we did is we took either mice that were just normal B6 mice or mice that were MHC class two knockouts, which um, lack CD4 cells, and looked for eosinophils, which are driven into the lung by IL-5 production. And uh, what we saw, and you can see it better in the graph, this makes it look like a more uh, impressive population because there's really no cells in this lung in the class two knockout, um, is that there's really no eosinophilia in the absence of CD4 cells. So this is not an innate lymphoid cell driven disease. This is a CD4 T cell driven disease. And we uh, showed that additionally doing all sorts of other um, things, including uh, looking for mucus production and airway remodeling. You can see the dark pink here is the mucus production that you see in the airways day three post challenge. Um, we did airway hyperresponsiveness. You don't get airway hyperresponsiveness in the absence of CD4 T cells. So all of this sort of classic symptom type of, uh, of measurements that you can do for airway inflammation were present in this system and they were dependent on the presence of CD4 T cells. So the next question was, okay, we have an effector population, but are these really tissue resident memory cells? And, and what do these cells look like over time? And if we measure the, the numbers of cells in both the spleen and lymph nodes and the lungs, they're not enormous. I mean, this is not like a big viral infection, or if you look at LCMV or listeria infection, um, this was, they, they were modest, but they were persistent. And we could find these cells both in the spleen and lymph nodes and in the lungs at all time points we looked. Um, we actually got better at uh, pulling the cells out of the lungs with time. Um, and even though they're small populations, uh, this is day 150 post allergen challenge, you can still find these tetramer positive cells in the lung tissue, so they don't express thy 1.2. Um, they're not cycling as um, assessed by the cell cycle marker KI67. They're KI67 negative. Um, and about 90% of them express GATA3. So they retain this Th2 uh, phenotype. Um, and so we were pretty happy with that. But then everyone said, well, no, you can't say it's a tissue resident memory cell yet. You know, does it express CD69? So. Yes, these cells express CD69 for almost the entire, uh, every time we've looked. And in fact, I think those cells are preferentially retained over time as the percentage of CD69 positive cells goes up. They don't express CCR7, which is um, in keeping with the CD8 literature as well. But really what people wanted to see was, do they migrate if you do parabiosis experiments? And um, we did these studies in collaboration with uh, Dave Massifus at the University of Minnesota, and what we did is we immunized mice that expressed one congenic marker, the CD45.1. We then joined the circulation of this immunized mouse with another mouse that expressed a different congenic marker. 
and this mouse is not immunized. So any antigen experienced cells have to be coming from the CD45.1 mouse. And if you look in the blood of these uh, mice two weeks later, what you can see is you get a complete mixing of the CD45.1 and 0.2 um, cells. So as you would expect, circulation works. The cells mix in the circulation. <laughs> if you look in the spleen and lymph nodes, you can also find um, cells that are from the immunized mouse in both the immunized animal and the unimmunized animal, showing you the circulating memory cells that have gone into the spleen and lymph node. But if you look in the lung, what was exciting and really proved that this is tissue resident memory population is that you primarily saw cells in the immunized animal that were CD69 positive and thyroid point two negative. And even though we could find one or two cells um, in the unimmunized animal, these cells didn't express CD69 and they labeled with the Thi 1.2 marker, meaning they were in the circulation. So we were catching cells that were circulating through the unimmunized animal. So that's pretty much as stringent as you can get for showing that there's resident memory cells. Um, and so we could actually move on from, from that point, which was good, and now nobody ever has to do that again. Um, so great, we've got tissue resident memory cells. What do they do? Do they actually do anything um, that's functionally interesting? And so what we decided to do was take advantage of um, the fact that migrating T cells uh, need to upregulate this molecule S1P receptor 1. And you can actually give an agonist to cells that, that leads to the downregulation of that receptor. And what that does is it, in effect, uh, traps cells wherever they are. So if they're in the lung, they're stuck in the lung. If they're in the spleen, they're stuck in the spleen, and the blood gets completely cleared out of these cells. And uh, it's an interesting molecule, FTY720. It's also called fingolamide, and it's, it's also a treatment for multiple sclerosis, um, interestingly enough. Um, so what we decided to do was to give the mice FTY720, this S1P receptor agonist, to basically trap the cells in the lung and not allow circulation from the spleen and lymph nodes to see what the contribution of the lung cells alone was. And we did the asthma inf um, induction, the airway inflammation induction, and then looked for airway hyperresponsiveness, which is a, is a measure of, of how much inflammation there is. And what we could see is that in mice that were given the S1P receptor agonist where only the lung cells could contribute to the response, you get good airway hyperresponsiveness. I think if we had more animals, it might even be better than, than when cells were circulating, um, which showed us that we actually had cells that were, causing, that were trapped in the lung that were causing this, this symptom, which was good. So we then moved on, since we had these pathological cells that, that we had targeted, um, we knew they were, they were the problem. And we went back to some of the um, earlier work that I did to think about how these cells would be generated, where they would be coming from. And um, one of the things that I studied a lot when I was in Mark's lab um, at the University of Minnesota was how does a naive T cell make this decision to either become what I call a non-TFH or an effector cell versus a cell that can go to the B cell follicle and uh, really help out uh, germinal center production and, and B cell uh, plasmablast formation. And um, I'm sure, if you, as you've seen in uh, Ken's talks, you can actually look for markers of these TFH cells by the expression of uh, CXCR5 and then this master transcription factor of GCTFH cells called BCL6. And what we found when we did these studies is that there are actually three populations of these cells. These are the effector cells, or the non-TFH cells that don't express CXCR5. These cells that are intermediate here, we think sit at the TB border and can interact with B cells, but don't really go into the follicle or the germinal center reaction, compared to these GCTFH cells that express high levels of BCL6 and go into the germinal center. And what we found in a model of um, bacterial infection with an attenuated listeria is that this decision between becoming an effector cell and becoming a TFH cell was really driven um, by the presence of IL-2, which drove the effector cells, or the upregulation of BCL-6 um, and ICOS and a whole program of other, other molecules that drove these TFH cells. And B cells were critically important for maintaining this program. So in the absence of B cells, you lose the TFH cells and they sort of head back in this T effector cell um, uh, direction. 
And um, this was important because it also led to the formation of different kinds of memory <coughs> cells. So what we found was that central memory cells were derived from these TFH cells, whereas effector memory cells were derived from these T effector cells. And so you could just make this an even bigger, more complicated mess and add some memory cells on here. But generally, the effectors all go off in one direction, and then the central memory cells and the TFH cells go in this other direction. Um, so we wanted to see if similar programs happen in a TH2 cell. This was all in TH1 cells. And so the first thing we looked at is, are there TFH cells that form here? And we, we sort of knew from the IL-4 data earlier that there were. Um, and was that, that associated with the upregulation of BCL-6 and the downregulation of GATA-3? And we found that that was true, too. So the effectors express more of this master transcription factor of a TH2 cell, GATA-3. The TFH cells express less of it. They express more BCL-6. All of that looked great. It all held. So we decided to test whether this role for IL-2 that we'd found in TH1 cells also held for this, this TH2 model. And to do this, we made mixed bone marrow chimeras where we took um, bone marrow from either wild type or CD25 knockout um, animals. CD25 is uh, the high affinity receptor component of the IL-2 signaling pathway. So these CD25 knockout cells lack IL-2 signaling generally. Um, they can't really uh, signal through beta and gamma. So what we found is if we looked in the spleen and lymph nodes, these are the wild type cells on the y-axis and the CD25 knockout cells on the x-axis. As we'd seen in a TH1 response, there's really no difference in vivo in proliferation in the presence or absence of IL-2, so, which is very different from the in vitro results. But um, there's a pretty much 50-50 split between the spleen and lymph nodes. But if we looked in the lungs, we found that the CD25 knockout cells really didn't seed the lungs. And that got worse over time. Um, so by the time you got to the memory phase, there might have been some effectors that made it in, but there were no memory cells that actually uh, seeded that lung, uh, demonstrating that cells that lack IL-2 signaling do not form these CD4 TRM cells. Um, and that's just shown graphically here. Um, now, there could be many, many ways that IL-2 is acting. These are the three components of the receptor. And so what we were looking at is in the absence of the alpha chain right here. Um, there is a PI3 kinase signaling pathway, STATs, um, mac erc pathways, um, and, and I think these all have differential roles in, in how IL-2 drives uh, cell differentiation, and uh, now we know migration. So it can affect proliferation. We see less of an effect in vivo. IL-2 can regulate survival. Um, it can, as I showed you, it can change the differentiation of the cells to become more of an effector cell versus a TFH cell. Um, it drives Treg differentiation. And then there are these random papers that also show that it can control migration. And um, they're actually very well done and, and very interesting. Um, and so we looked at all of these things, and um, the, we're still actually working on this. But the one thing that we, we found that was lacking in our CD25 knockout uh, populations was this population of effector cells down in this bottom left quadrant that uh, had downregulated L-selectin, which allows cells to migrate out of the, the lymphoid organs. Um, and so we think that these cells um, that are sort of stuck up here uh, can't actually leave the lymphoid organs. They, they're retained there, um, but we're still working on that. Um, we also found differences in chemokine receptors, but they were all shifty, and they were not that impressive. C CCR4 was slightly lower, CXCR3 was slightly lower, but again, you know, if, if this is the small population of precursors that's seeding that, that pool, it's gonna be hard to say what that is. So we're doing the individual knockouts now to see, see how that happens. Um, so the next question was, is this, is this a fork in the pathway? So, you know, we'd seen that this was going in one direction or the other direction for the TFH and the T effectors in a TH1 response. Was this similar in a TH2 response? And we could um, get at that question by making uh, T cells that lacked BCL6 or doing these experiments in um, B cell deficient mice. And what we would expect is if the TRMs were coming off of this branch, we would potentially get more of these tissue resident memory cells. 
And so the first experiments we did was to make, uh, again, <coughs> mixed bone marrow chimeras. So bone marrow from a BCL6 knockout animal or from a wild type animal with congenic markers marking the two populations, put them into an irradiated mouse, let the mouse reconstitute, and then induce this inflammation. Um, and what you can see here is there's actually a really interesting three to one uh, ratio of wild type cells to BCL6 knockouts in the spleen and lymph nodes. Um, these cells completely lacked, these BCL6 knockouts, completely lacked TFH cells. Um, <coughs> but in the lung, this ratio was, is inverted. So now it's 26% it's wild type, 70% BCL6 knockout. So these BCL6 knockout cells are preferentially migrating to the lung um, and are not in the spleen. Uh, we saw a similar type of thing in the mice that actually lack B cells. So in mice that are mu uh, deficient, they lack the development of B cells because they can't get a signal during B cell development. Um, and what we could see is, again, uh, there are fewer of these cells in, a, in an animal that lacks B cells. Um, they don't have any TFH cells, which you can see here. Uh, they have a small population of TFH cells, but no GCTFH cells. Um, and again, we looked in the lung, and we saw more of these derpy-1-specific cells in the lung, um, suggesting, again, that B cells actually inhibit this TRM um, formation. And so in the absence of B cells, you get more of these tissue-resident memory cells in the tissues. And I think that's really important because a lot of us take a mouse and we say, oh, it's a B cell deficient mouse, it lacks antibodies. But you don't even think about all the other downstream implications that are, are going on um, with that mouse, um, including uh, driving other T cell programs that you might not think about. Um, and these cells look like tissue resident memory cells. They, they behave like tissue resident memory cells. Um, so so we, we know that they they are there, and they can induce asthma just as well as a wild-type um, animal. Um, this is a MUMT that is naive, is down here, so a mouse that lacks B cells. And this is a sensitized mouse. Here's the B6. And so even in the absence of antibodies, which are, are really important for, um, for the, the Th2 response, and IgE is critical to this response, there are enough TRM cells in the lungs that it, it supersedes that, and so you get really good uh, induction of airway hyperresponsiveness in these animals. And so we've moved on from this to see how this pertains to other types of infections. So if we go back to our Th1 models, does IL-2 drive these tissue resident memory cells um, in a Th1 model as well? And um, we did this actually using a virus called LCMV, which is a commonly uh, used model virus um, that immunologists use a lot. But one thing that I found out is LCMV is actually naturally, it's, it was found originally in uh, rodents, and it's inhaled. So it's actually an intranasal pathogen. Um, and so we immunized mice intranasally with LCMV and then just measured the induction of these LCMV-specific cells in the spleen and lymph nodes or the lungs. Um, again, gating on these thy 1.2 negative cells in the lung parenchyma, we could find that those tissue resident memory cells form. Now, we didn't do the parabiosis experiments, and people uh, have said that they're not necessarily tissue resident memory cells because of that. But what we can say is that they stick around for a really long period of time, so 150 days later, you can still find these cells in the lung. Um, interestingly, uh, these cells uh, in previous studies that we'd done with intranasal inoculation, you can primarily induce Th17 cells because it's a mucosal infection. But in this situation, we induce TBAD expressing uh, cells, so a real Th1 response and very few uh, Th17 cells here. And it's not even that exciting after what I just told you, but if you do the experiments and look for how CD25 regulates the induction of these cells, what you can find is in the lung, the wild-type cells um, vastly outnumber the CD25 knockout cells, even though they don't in the spleen and lymph nodes. Um, again, showing that IL-2 drives these, these populations of tissue-resident memory cells. Um, and you can just see that that ratio uh, is different in the lung than it is in the spleen and lymph nodes, where it's about 1 to 1, and here it's about 4 to 4 to 1. 
and that changes over time. If you wait until the memory phase, this goes up to about uh, 10 to 1. So, so we've shown that, that both, of, both uh, TH1 and TH2 resident memory cells uh, require IL-2 signaling, and we're working out what those signals are that are really important. We won't ever be able to block allergen responses from occurring, because you don't know when that's going to happen, right? But what we can do now is really start to figure out how to block the maintenance of these cells. And so our work now is really focusing on these structures in which these T cells are found. And they're really, really interesting. Um, these, these tertiary lymphoid structures that I was telling you about um, in the lung have T cell areas and B cell areas. They're loosely organized. They can have these high endothelial venules for naive T cells to come in. They really almost form a secondary lymphoid organ um, in the tissues. And these have been known for a long time. Uh, this picture from, this was from a review from Troy Randall, and this picture here is from Jan Erickson in influenza. And what you can see here is these IgD-expressing B cells um, surrounding, so you have a B cell follicle uh, right next to and in close association with CD4 T cells. Um, you can find germinal centers. You can find follicular uh, uh, dendritic cells in here. Um, so they're, they're really interesting. So we look to see if we have these same types of structures and is this how these cells are maintained for such long periods of time. And so um, what you can see here is this is a naive lung um, in a mouse. Now obviously that never happens in a person. You're exposed continuously with high levels of allergen. But in a mouse that's kept in an SPF facility, the only place you can see T cells <laughs> is migrating through these th CD31 positive uh, blood vessels. But if you look at our um, immunized airway inflamed um, lungs four days after that last dosage of, of allergen, what you can see is these uh, B cells are in blue, and hopefully you can see that, and the T cells are in red, and they form these clusters of B cells, and we're now studying what these B cells are um, are they responsible for the rapid IgE production? What are the requirements um, for maintenance of the T cells? Because B cells can actually maintain T, T cells. Um, so if the B cells are actually what's keeping these T cells there, can we knock that out to get rid of these structures? And how would you do that specifically to target the allergen-specific cells and not the, the ones that are responsible for immunity to other diseases? Yeah. These clusters create some sort of unique matrix in that area? That yeah, so they have um, their whole uh, stromal networks in here. So there are fibroreticular cells, there are um, FDCs, which are, are stromal cells too. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting structure. And I think, I think a lot more is going to be done with these because this is, this is what becomes the sentinel for, for any pathogen that's going to come in through the airways and also the gut. I mean, Peyer's patches are similar to these in many ways. Yeah. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Donna Farber's done some really interesting studies uh, looking at autopsy patients, and um, she's actually seen not only she can't call them tissue resident memory cells, but she calls them effector memory cells that look just like these um, in close association with B cells. Um, so so it appears that they're there in people as well. Um, so but I don't think we know enough about them yet. And obviously they're really hard to study in people unless you're gonna, I, I, do you know about this paper? So she had all of her postdocs and graduate students um, basically on call anytime there was an accident or, or something where they could get an autopsy sample. And they did every tissue to see where the T cells were, where the B cells were, what they looked like. It's a pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, it's a lot easier to do that in mice. Um, and just the last little bit I'm going to talk about is one of the things that we're thinking about is how are these uh, how are these structures set up, and once they're set up, how do they contribute to uh, to additional diseases? And one of the things that's been known for a long time is that um, kids who are exposed to RSV at early ages, in which they end up in the hospital. Um, have a higher prevalence of asthma shortly thereafter. And so one of the things that, that we're really interested in, this is just showing 
this here, the non-hospitalized kids with RSV are in orange and the hospitalized kids um, that were RSV positive, this is their asthma prevalence um, up to about age 12 are in blue. Um, and so one of, one of the things that we're really interested in is how do those changes um, induced by viral infections to that lung epithelia and to places where you could have these structures then lead to the induction of asthma? Does it draw in those cells more? And uh, one of the reasons why we thought that this would be interesting is because, again, you can see the similar types of structures that look very, um, they, they look like they've got a lot of the same attributes as our, as our eyeball structures. Um, with our allergen model, this is in a mouse looking at RSV, and all the way out at day 77 post-infection, those structures are still there. Um, and uh, that's just showing that there. And so what we decided to do is to give mice RSV and then um, wait for 21 days or so until we could actually measure by PCR that the virus had been cleared, um, which we're still working on. I still think there's some virus there. But, um, and then go through our airway inflammation model and just see, do you actually get more cells that are allergen specific if you have this viral infection first? And uh, if we looked at the spleen and lymph nodes, and again, we're looking for our allergen-specific cells here, you don't see any difference whether the mouse just got HDM, so it just got the house dust mite allergen, or whether it got the RSV, then uh, the house dust mite. But if you look in the lung, and this is uh, still being repeated many times, this is the first experiment that we've done, um, hot off the presses. Uh, so you can see that there are actually more of these derpy-1-specific cells in the lung parenchyma. Um, at this 18-day uh, time point if RSV infection occurred first. So um, it, it suggests to us that maybe viral infection is, is changing some of those structures in the lung, um, similarly to what you just asked, you know, what are, what are the changes that happen there, and can a viral infection make these changes such that it's more permissive to these allergen-specific cells to, to enter into there. So in conclusion, we have developed this system to study endogenous TH2 memory um, in a model of airway inflammation. These derpy one specific memory cells in the spleen and lymph nodes are not required to induce asthmatic symptoms. Um, I'm sure they contribute, and uh, we're still trying to figure out how they do, but they're, they're not the immediate pathological cells. Um, in data that I didn't show, these tissue resonant memory cells uh, form within the first five days of exposure, so there's some signaling that's happening really early. And we know that these cells are dependent upon IL-2. And IL-2, we think, regulates a migrational program that consists of the downregulation of adhesion molecules and the upregulation of specific chemokine receptors. But again, we want to find the one that, that prevents uh, the migration of these cells, which we haven't yet. Um, and we know that BCL6 and B cells repress this early TRM formation. Um, and uh, now we're trying to figure out how these structures and these T cell and B cell interactions in the lung, um, whether induced by virus or allergen challenge, can lead to the maintenance of these cells so that we could disrupt it. Um, and then this work was primarily done by a research scientist in the lab, Brian Hondowitz. Uh, this is my lab at a lab party. We do not have children in the lab working. These are my children. <laughs> these do. Um, and these are our collaborators. So James Moon, who is a, a very talented postdoc at, uh, at the University of Minnesota when I was there, we both made these derpy one tetramers when we started our labs, and he said, you do it. I don't care about allergens. So, okay, thanks. So I always thank James for that. Um, Dave Massapust and Jason Schenkel did the parabiosis studies. Uh, Bill Altemeyer helped us with our airway hyperresponsiveness, and then we got mice and reagents from Steve and Andrew and Marcus, and then my funding. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Do we see neutrophils in the secondary lymphoid organs? I don't know if we've looked specifically for that. I know, um, at least during the primary, we didn't see eosinophils during that first challenge. Um, I don't know if they come in during the airway inflammation, but I don't, I don't know. How 
Yeah. 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 I'm in in my maybe somewhat simplistic uh, way of thinking about it. I think it's through maintaining the TFH phenotype. So it's I don't think it's an active inhibition. Well, it's inhibition through maintaining the TFH phenotype. They maintain BCL6 in the T cells, and in the absence of those interactions, BCL6 gets downregulated. And then that allows, I mean, ask Ken, he'll tell you more about the transcriptional regulation, but that would allow those other programs to dominate. So I think, I think that's what it's doing, but I don't know. To, to follow up on that, actually, um, so you think the role for IL-2 is probably, for tissue resident memory cells, is maybe early on. Is there a role for IL-2 in survival of those cells long term, yeah. or do you think that's more IL-7, IL-15? So they express really high levels of CD127, so we think that probably is other uh, cytokines. Um, what we've done, I think maybe, maybe, I don't know if I told you. Uh, we have CD25 flox mice that we've crossed to CD4 Cre RT2 mice, and so what we can do is inducibly knock out IL-2 signaling at different time points mm. and say, you know, when, what happens once you get to the, you know, are there multiple places? And IL-2 is produced in so many places, it could be at multiple points, um, but we're, we're knocking out something very early. Okay. Yeah. Good question. I'll, I'll ask one more then. So, so B cells early, interactions with B cells early on seem to inhibit the TRM formation. Mm -hmm. But are you invoking a role for B cells later than it, again, in providing survival in these ectopic cells? Yeah. Centers? So I'm trying to figure out how that would work. If well, so we have the same thing with central memory cells, right? So mm -hmm. in the absence of B cells, um, central memory cells don't form very well. But if you make, um, if you get central memory formation in a wild type mouse and then deplete the B cells with anti CD20, the yeah, sorry. central <laughs> memory cells also go away. So I think they're just two separate, again, they're two separate roles. There's an induction role, and then there's a, a maintenance role. Survival signals mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. Maybe through IL-715. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I see the similar population that you showed in the 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 tissue resident memory cells? So again, you know, I don't think there's that much known. So it's known that over time, more cells can be found in the lung tissue. So again, another paper of Donna Farmer, she looked autopsy patients um, from two, age two to 12. And you can see an increase consistently every year of the number of cells that are in the lung suggesting that you're building up these memory populations, but it's conjecture. I mean, I don't, I don't know, I'm hand waving. No, uh -uh. just autopsy patients. No, very stringent, no Could they disease. correlate any autoimmune disease with the presence of those, of additional ectopic tumor centers? Did they look at that at all? I don't Were they think even allowed so. To I don't, I don't think so, yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, if not, join me in thanking uh, our speaker again. Thank you.